Welcome back to Torchbearers. On today's episode, we welcome Dr. Jason Hallman, class of 2006, to the podcast. Stay tuned. Today, we welcome to Torchbearers Jason Hallman, class of 2006. Welcome, Jason. Thanks, Michael. Glad to be here. Talk a little bit to us about what you're doing now. Yeah, well, so I work for Toyota Motor North America, uh, specifically the research and development area in a place called the Collaborative Safety Research Center. Uh, the CSRC, as we call it, is basically a small research team uh, with some multi multidisciplinary expertise with the mission to promote advanced research technology to support the safe integration of future mobility solutions for all. Uh, we do that by partnering with university researchers here in North America to address gaps in knowledge or perhaps some questions having to do with keeping people safe either in vehicles or maybe even in a future scenarios related to automated driving or micro mobility or things like that. Um, we have some expertise in, just in, in doing research in distracted driving or even like crash protection, what we call like passive safety, you know, airbags and seatbelts and in the modeling of the computer modeling of things like that. We also do a lot of work in crash avoidance, uh, which we call active safety. This means like the, the automatic braking or the lane departure alerts, the beeps and buzzers and things that people are beginning to experience more and more in kind of their highest technology vehicles that they ride today. And we also talk about the education of those features. You know, people who buy a brand new vehicle may not be as accustomed to some of these features as those who maybe have been living with them for a few years. And so we study ways to kind of help people learn these features quickly and, and learn their limitations in order to enhance the benefits that drivers can get from using these technologies every day. So talk a little bit about what your uh, educational background here at Valpo was and how your time at Valpo helped to prepare you for uh, your path today. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so my background and my study area of study at Velpo was mechanical engineering. And, you know, it's some of the things that I'm responsible for now and, and partnering with other people to work on are, are very different from that. And, and that's been really interesting. And actually, I've really helped. Uh, I've been really helped by my time at Velpo to kind of work into newer and newer areas because Velpo's education is so broad, right? It's, it's a kind of a classical liberal arts education. Uh, we learned a lot in Christ College about critical thinking. And so we're not just talking about at Belpo about um, the formulas you need to, to be a good engineer or the standard engineering processes, although those are important. Uh, but asking broader questions and digging down deeper into the motivations of, of why we want to do, why we want to ask these questions, why we want to use this formula, why we want to solve this problem even. Um, I loved my time in Christ College. I spent a lot of time in the Honor Council too, and we really had an opportunity there to interact with a lot of different people um, to, and to think about you know, the ethics of, of what we do and why we're doing it and why we're here uh, learning uh, at, at, at Valpo. Um, I also learned like, to, uh, to not be afraid to, to move outside of my comfort zone you know, engineering is kind of a really niche area of study at, uh, at Valpo and at other places, right? And and uh, it, it's easy to kind of get tunnel vision and focus on your engineering classes and your engineering colleagues and your engineering experience. But what I loved about Valpo being a smaller school with a really broad liberal arts focus was that it really drew the engineers, including myself, my young engineering self, out of that kind of that engineering tunnel vision and into the other areas that uh, the other things that were going on at the school. Um, you know, I was an engineer, but I was also really interested in the performing arts. And I got to do music through trumpet choir and luce band. Um, I was in the men's chorus and find new alpha. And I really enjoyed that time. I, uh, I did some theater uh, through the liturgical drama troupe at the time called Soul Purpose. And that's where I met my wife. That was a really important choice that I made. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to uh, meet and marry her. Um, and so Velpo gave me the kind of the confidence to to try new things, to 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 
not be afraid to not be the expert in the room or be the, the guy who knew what to do. And so having the humility to kind of accept guidance from wherever I may receive it. Um, and you know, you know, working in this kind of this, the CSRC now where we have human factors experts and we have cognitive scientists, uh, electrical engineers, and these are people who are much smarter than me, honestly, <laughs> like in their areas of expertise. But I was a mechanical engineer and I, I went on to graduate school to study biomedical engineering, but um, no amount of kind of training is going to prepare you for uh, the broad questions that we uh, are grappling with at the CSRC. And honestly, where I think a lot of people, you know, spend a lot of their time in their own career. Right. Um, the last thing that I think really kind of helped me at Valpo prepare was kind of this, Valpo was beating this drum of vocation. And <laughs> And at the time, I was like, every, we hear it all the time. I know. And you know what? When I was at Valpo, like, I guarantee I'd roll my eyes every time. Right. Oh, right. my gosh. It's the V word again. But, you know, I didn't appreciate it. And at, I, I wish I would have, like, thought about it more because, you know, I, I wrestled a little bit with what to do after I graduated because I wanted to make a difference with my career, with my job. And uh, even though I didn't sway from mechanical engineering, I wasn't really sure what to do with that. And I, I landed on um, the, my graduate school experience in biomedical engineering because I wanted to do something like to help people sure. on an individual level. And so I, I, I pursued something called injury biomechanics, where we're basically like studying how crash forces in a car crash can, can be mitigated through new safety features. Um, so, I don't know, you know, that was, I, I really love those three things, like the, the broader questions aspect, like the pulling people into different areas that they're not sure. in their comfort zone. And of course, you know, the big B location. Sure. Yeah. Um, so you would enjoy that we now have a biomedical engineering program at Valpo. So yeah, I, um, I, I'm familiar with it. I, I've, uh, I've interacted with some of the faculty that are doing it. awesome. I'm really excited that they have. That Great. Yeah. Cause yeah, we've got some alum, alum, alumni who are faculty there. So great. Mm -hmm. So, um, how did you discover that safety was actually your vocation? Uh, that's a that's a really good question. Um, the, you know, since I was a kid, I loved cars and taking things apart, putting them back together, kind of in a very classic engineering sure. mindset. Um, but as I mentioned before, I really wanted to kind of do that. I, I wasn't really enthralled by the idea of just building cars because I had heard some rumors about the car industry being a lot of kind of working with nuts and bolts and not really getting to see the big picture. And, um, and I also had this kind of this, um, we'll call it a hobby interest in medicine, but I didn't really want to go to grad school. And so, or sorry, I didn't really want to go to medical school. Yeah, and so I ended up going to this graduate school path in biomedical engineering, which is very tangential to uh, the medicine and uh, the physicians. Sure. And uh, and when I was there, I had this rolling five-year plan of like what I was going to do with this degree, uh, and it was like going to be consulting in like crash reconstruction or be a professor in the university setting. And you know, honestly, most of my Except my most recent plan, it ra it rarely worked out, <laughs> and so of course I know I'm, <laughs> um, but I learned to kind of you know hold those make those plans because they're helpful to you, but to hold them loosely because you don't know what the next step is going to be, like what what new opportunity is going to come to you, um, and so I I wanted to be in crash safety as I mentioned, and but as I've and, and that led to an opportunity at Toyota, which has been uh, a phenomenal experience. But as I've been at Toyota for almost 10 years now, like safety has actually is, is an evolving concept because it used to be, how do you protect people in a crash? But as the technology is advanced, it's now advancing to the point where we're not talking as much about protecting people at crashes, although that's important, we're still doing the same things. Then. But the next step is how do we prevent the crash from occurring in the first place? Absolutely. Right? And, um, and as we're looking even further into the future, we're now starting to talk about you know, like automated driving. Like how do we remove the driver's mistakes and warnings even from the need to keep people safe? And I'm really excited about that too. And you know, kind of having this 
Valparaiso University based vision of what vocation is mm -hmm. has allowed me to not focus in on what I was trained to do, meaning crash safety, but to think about the bigger picture about what is my calling to help keep our customers safe. Sure. And, and so that can follow that regardless of the technology, you know, that I can follow that and, and move into those new areas. And that's been, that's been a really wonderful and exciting journey um, that Jesus has led me on. Uh, that last part about kind of automated driving has been particularly important to me on a personal level. Um, I have a, my, my third son, he's now three years old. He was born with a chronic eye disease. And that disease, um, he, he didn't have any sight when he was born, but oh, wow. through wonderful medicine. Sure. Yeah, but through the wonderful gift of medicine that, and the doctors that we've had access to, um, he's got great vision now. But he's always going to have this. Sure. And it's it's. And he may he, he may lose sight over time again. And and the gift of automated driving in the future is really something that I am excited Absolutely. to perhaps provide to him in the future and in a really safe way, like keeping customers safe. Um so yeah. Great. So um kind of tying it back to Valpo. So what does Valpo mean to you? And we've talked about the big V vocation already. The other thing that like has always echoed in my mind since that time there is kind of this intersection of faith and learning. And I think a number of people at you know Chapel would talk about that, um, and and but university leadership. And I really love that concept. Yeah, I, no, I was just gonna say we always hear about where Athens meets Jerusalem. So <laughs> that's true. Right. That's right. Yep. And that's why the library and the chapel have always been next door to each other, right? Yep. Athens and Jerusalem. I love that. And I think like um the the meeting of those two is really fantastic because I, I think about it not just as like tangentially or up next to each other, but actually being integrated with each other. Sure. Like this tearing down of walls of division between sacred and secular. Um when we talk about you know living your life in service to others, um, that I heard that a lot as a student as well. I hear it now even. Um, I think it, it really can open up ways of thinking to how you can serve um, people, serve society, serve the church uh, through your everyday lives, regardless of whether or not you're a church worker. Sure. Right. We we're, we're all we're all church workers in the sense that we belong to Christ Church. And we, and if we work for His glory, um, and so Valpo, I think, has a really unique role to play in that kind of discussion, that broader discussion within the Big C Church. Like that, you know, most careers are sacred vocations. That we're as long as we have the heart posture of looking for opportunities to be a part of the restorative work in the world. Great. And so to kind of wrap it all up. What is one question that you wish I had asked you um, coming into the podcast? I love this question. I've heard you ask it to other people. So, <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I wish uh, someone would ask me, uh, "What is some? What is? What do I wish someone would have told me earlier in my life?" Um, and and I kind of harkens back a little bit to what I mentioned earlier about having this five-year plan and holding it loosely. You know, I didn't always live like that. In fact, when I was at Valpo, I, like, from the moment I set foot on campus, I was like, I am working toward this goal at the end of my four years. And, you know, I would have a new goal every six months. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And, and, and it never was what I actually did. Um, and I what I wish people would have told me at the time, or maybe they were, I just wasn't listening, is that you don't have to have it all planned out. In college and early adulthood, that plan just rarely works out, and it's okay. Uh, some people some people find their vocations through trial and error, like right. pursuing one thing after another. Um, and and that, that's, that's an okay plan, and for some people, it really works for them. But you know what? Um, that might be, for some, a burden, and it was for me this burden that, you know, I need to figure out what, what I mm -hmm. need to do with my life because my graduation date is coming up fast, like a freight train <laughs> and I better make sure that I'm on the right track. And I don't think that is a very biblical expression of vocation. 
you know, if, if vocation is about a divine calling, then, you know, callings are received. They're not pursued. Sure. And, um, and so I think that's for those who need to hear it. And I was one of them. As long as you have a heart, a heart posture of a response rather than like a, a ringing out or a tense, like digging for this, this sense of vocation, um, it will all work out. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jason, for joining us here on Torchbearers. And we look forward to talking with you again soon. Thank you, Mike. Pleasure to be here.